clouds can be divided into four major categories, and three are based on height. So here are the categories. High clouds have the Latin prefix cir, C-I-R-R. Turns out the clouds are, um, the cloud names are Latin. Okay, back in the day, way back in the day, people uh, would learn Latin in school. Okay, um, maybe that takes place in, uh, for a small fraction of students today. Anyway, high clouds begin with the Latin prefix cir. Middle clouds begin with the Latin prefix alto, which is interesting because in Espanol, alto means tall, right? Um, clouds that begin with alto, uh, that Latin prefix, are found in the middle part of the um, uh, region of clouds. And if one of the cat height categories is height, another one is middle, and there's only three, so there's one more category for height. What do you think it is? High, middle, and low. Low clouds have the Latin prefix strat. Although there's one low cloud that actually begins with another word and has strat as a root. And the fourth category of clouds is vertical development. And those clouds begin with the Latin prefix cumu. Now these clouds are very interesting because they can exist in more than one of these height layers. They can start in the region where low clouds are found and grow vertically to the region where high clouds are found. So because they can exist in multiple height regions, they have their own category. Okay, These other clouds will only be found in one of these height regions. And we'll talk about the specific clouds names and where the height regions are, okay? How f high above the surface would a high cloud be, okay? Now there's a couple of clouds that can produce rain. Those clouds producing rain have the nim root. Nim is Latin for rain. The two clouds that can produce rain, there's only two, are nimbostratus and cumulonimbus. Nimbostratus is a low cloud, you see the strat in the uh, name, whereas cumulonimbus, beginning with the Latin prefix cumu, is a cloud of vertical development. There are a few other clouds that can produce snow flurries. Um, there are clouds that can produce drizzle. Drizzle droplets are smaller than raindrops, but believe it or not, only two clouds can actually produce rainfall. Nimbostratus tends to produce... Um, light to moderate steady precipitation, whereas cumulonimbus produces heavy, more showery precipitation. Okay, Cumulonimbus are the thunderstorm clouds. Now, clouds can be composed of what? When, when you see a cloud, what are you looking at, right? We've talked about this. Well, you're looking at water in one of two forms. Well, at least one of two forms. Clouds can be made of liquid droplets. Low clouds, because they are close to the ground and warm, they are made exclusively of liquid droplets. Whereas high clouds are so far above the surface that they are made exclusively of ice crystals. Now, there are two cloud categories where it's not so um, one or the other. Clouds beginning with the Latin prefix alto, those that are middle clouds, as well as clouds beginning with the prefix cumul, can be made of both cloud droplets and ice crystals. See, the middle clouds are found at levels in the atmosphere where you can have liquid droplets and ice crystals existing simultaneously. And then the vertical development clouds can begin near the ground where it's warm. It may be well above freezing. Okay, these cumulonimbus clouds can have bases at temperatures in the 70s and the 80 degree Fahrenheit range. And they can grow so high that eventually when you get to the top, it's well, well below freezing. And so they're made only of ice crystals. 
when a portion of the cloud is only made of ice crystals, it's called glaciated. Remember that in the troposphere, on average, temperature decreases 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit for every thousand feet one ascends. So let's take a look at the clouds, literally, see what how they appear, and talk about the specific names. Okay, this is a great figure from the book, showing the major cloud types. Okay all here in this one picture. So, you see the categories, the four categories we've talked about. High clouds, middle clouds, low clouds, and those of vertical development. Let's start at the top, talk about high clouds. They generally form above 23,000 feet, or 7,000 meters, um, in the middle and low latitudes. In the high latitudes where the air is very cold and the molecules are close together, um, they might be found at um, lower elevations. Now, because the air at these elevations above 23,000 feet above the surface is quite cold and dry, high clouds are made exclusively of ice crystals and are fairly thin. They usually appear bright, white-colored, except near sunrise and sunset, when the unscattered colors of sunlight, red, orange, and yellow, can be reflected from the undersides. Um, high clouds around the twilight hours can be very beautiful. The most common high clouds are cirrus, those thin, wispy high clouds um, that resemble mares tails. They're very thin. They're very um, long. They, they can look that way because of the strong winds at this level. Okay, these can form where the jet stream is found. Cirrus clouds generally move from west to east in the mid-latitudes because that's the general direction of the jet stream. Now, it, we'll talk more about the jet stream. It has waves, okay? It, um, it doesn't always flow west to east. It might flow northwest to southeast, southwest to northeast, but generally moves west to east as opposed to east to west or north to south. Okay. Cirrocumulus clouds are actually one of the rarest major cloud types. They appear, they appear as small rounded white puffs that may occur individually or in long rows. They are, the puffs are not necessarily small, but they appear small because they're so far away, right? We all know how if you look at an object, the farther away, the smaller it looks, okay? 23,000 feet is about four miles away, okay? So, um, the, the cirrocumulus clouds rarely cover more than a small fraction of the sky. The small ripples in the cirrocumulus resemble fish, resemble fish scales, hence the expression mackerel sky describes a sky full of cirrocumulus clouds. Okay. Now we also have cirrostratus clouds, which are so thin that the sun and moon can cl be clearly seen through them. Cirrostratus clouds often produce a halo, a ring of light, a circular ring of light that um, basically goes around the sun or moon. Sometimes the cirrostratus are so thin that you, the only way you can see them is when um, they form a halo around the sun or moon, especially at nighttime when it's dark. Cirrostratus clouds can occasionally form a head of an advancing mid-latitude cyclonic storm. They can be used to help predict rain or snow within 12 to 24 hours, especially if they are followed by middle clouds. Okay, so often one of the precursors to an incoming storm is cirrostratus clouds. It also sometimes cirrus, and if you start seeing these high clouds and then later, several hours, a few hours to several hours later, you start seeing middle clouds, that's a clue that a um, weather system, an exciting weather system that is, could be coming. And by the way, we'll talk more about this when we talk about cloud development and precipitation, but it's interesting that 
Even at temperatures of 0 Fahrenheit minus 18 Celsius, there are still far more liquid droplets than ice crystals. We know water freezes at 32 Fahrenheit, right? Well, it's not always that simple. Generally, the smaller the liquid water drop, okay, when um, the colder it has to be to completely freeze, okay? So only when you get down to minus 40 degrees Celsius or minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit where those temperature scales meet, do you actually only see ice crystals and no liquid droplets, okay? Now, middle clouds have bases between 6,500 feet just a little more than a mile above the surface to 23,000 feet, about four miles or four miles above the surface. Maybe a little higher in the low latitudes, maybe a little lower in the high latitudes, okay? These clouds are composed of water droplets and when the temperature is low enough, some ice crystals. There's two types of middle clouds, outer cumulus clouds or those that appear as gray puffy masses sometimes rolled out in parallel waves or bands. Usually, one part of the cloud is darker than another. Okay, they're not, uh, not um, entirely one color, which helps to separate or distinguish altocumulus from serocumulus. The puffs of altocumulus appear larger than serocumulus, which is another clue that you're looking at an altocumulus, not a serocumulus. It's also darker, see? It's more of a light gray as opposed to a bright white of serocumulus. A layer of altocumulus may be confused with altostratus. In the case of the doubt, clouds called altocumulus have rounded masses or rolls. They look like little castles, even. And they can indicate the presence of rising air. Um, the appearance of these clouds, these altocumulus clouds, on a warm, humid summer morning, such as on the, in the Midwest, on the Gulf Coast, on the East Coast, um, even in the Desert southwest during monsoon season can portend thunderstorms or predict thunderstorms by later afternoon. Now, Alto Stratus is a gray or blue gray sheet like cloud that often covers the entire sky. Um, when the sun is behind Alto Cumulus, or, or excuse me, when Alto Stratus covers the sun, it may distort the sun. The sun may take a watery, fuzzy appearance. See how it's not completely clear, okay? Um, thick cirrostratus clouds may sometimes be confused with thinner altostratus clouds. Um, usually cirrostratus are thin and altostratus are a little thicker, but sometimes cirrostratus might be thick enough and altostratus might be thin enough where they look similar. But some clues to help identify the cloud is, whether it's altostratus or cirrostratus, is the color. Altostratus is a little darker. The, dim, the sun. If the cloud is cirrostratus, you should be able to see the sun easily, okay? As Trump would say, easily, right? Um, behind it. But if it's altostratus, the sun's going to look distorted, okay? Another clue is shadows. Usually, cirrostratus clouds are transparent enough for the sun to produce shadows, whereas you won't be able to see your shadow um, for alto stratus. Alto stratus clouds can form ahead of storms containing relatively continuous precipitation. Alto stratus cannot produce rainfall. It may produce some snow flurries or some drizzle drops, but if it begins to lower, its base begins to lower, it can f help turn into a nimbostratus. A nimbostratus is a type of low cloud. Let's talk about low clouds. Those found within 6,500 feet of the surface, okay? Close to the ground. Generally, they're made only of liquid droplets, but if in really cold weather, they may be made of some ice crystals as well. The nimbostratus is a dark gray, damp appearing cloud layer associated with generally continuous falling rain, or sometimes snow. The intensity of this precipitation is usually light or moderate. It's never heavy or showery, okay? Different from chemonimbus. Part of the reason that the precipitation is, first of all, light to moderate is because 
Um, the vertical air motions in Nimbostratus, the updrafts and downdrafts, the moving currents of upward and downward air, are not strong enough to form very large raindrops. Okay, so that's part of it. It's also close to the ground, so the droplets do not have time to grow as much um, and become heavy. When the droplets uh, become larger, they fall faster. And then part of the reason that Nimbostratus is continuous, steady precipitation, or it produces such, is because... One, Nimbostratus often covers the entire sky, okay, so um, it moves, when it, as it's moving, it's, it's gonna, going to be a while before the whole thing moves. Um, and another thing is Nimbostratus tends to be more slower moving, okay. The base of Nimbostratus may be confused with Altostratus. In such case, remember, thin Nimbostratus is darker gray and... Um, Unlike altostratus, nimbostratus will produce rainfall. A low, lumpy cloud is stratocumulus. It appears in rows or patches, sometimes though rounded masses, that kind of rhymes, with blue sky visible between the cloud elements. Often stratocumulus appear near sunset as the spreading remains of a much larger cumulus cloud. The color of stratocumulus ranges from light to dark gray, often multicolored like altocumulus, often um, darker gray bottoms, whereas lighter gray sides, and from above it might look white even. If you want to really distinguish between stratocumulus and altocumulus, hold your hand at arm's length and point toward the cloud. Altocumulus cloud elements would generally be about the size of your thumbnail. Stratocumulus clouds, the size of your fist. They appear larger because stratocumulus is closer. Rain or snow rarely falls from stratocumulus, although it may produce some drizzle, but drizzle droplets are so small they often evaporate before reaching the ground. Then we have, ah, stratus. The uniform grayish cloud often covering the entire sky makes it very dark in the morning, the cloud that will hover and make it hard to wake up, right? Especially on Monday morning. This is that cloud that keeps it dark, reflects a lot of sunlight, okay? It's very thick, so it reflects a lot of sunlight and keeps it cooler. And when stratus is on the ground, you know what we call that? Fog, okay? Stratus resembles a cloud that does not reach the gro fo ground. Fog that reaches the ground. Actually, Sometimes what happens is fog will begin to lift, burn off, and so then what's left is stratus hovering above the ground. Drizzle may fall from stratus. This is very common in San Francisco in the summertime. Nimbostratus and stratus are easily confused, but one distinction between them is that stratus has a more uniform base than nimbostratus. Stratus may be confused with altostratus, but remember, a stratus is lower, it's darker gray, okay? And, oh, here's another important clue, folks. Stratus will often completely cover the sun. You will not be able to see the sun through stratus, okay? So if you kind of know where the sun should be, right, what time of day it is, where the sun should be, and you don't, and you don't see the sun at all because of uh, stratus, cover, because of Cloud coverage, that should be stratus, okay? Whereas if it's altostratus, you'll be able to see a watery sun behind those clouds. Puffy cumulus clouds are those familiar fair weather clouds that take on a variety of shapes, but often resemble floating cotton candy or popcorn. The base appears white to light gray. On a humid day, the base may only be a few thousand feet above the ground, and the individual cloud may only be a half a mile wide. The top of the cloud denotes the limit of rising air, and it's usually not very high. However, it may grow during the course of a day. Okay. By the way, stratocumulus and cumulus will often look similar, but cumulus clouds are generally more detached from each other than stratocumulus, which may appear as groups. Also, cumulus has a uh, greater vertical extent than stratocumulus, okay? Stratocumulus is a little puffy, but not very vertically extending. 
Harmless looking cumulus clouds can develop on warm summer humid mornings. By afternoon, they may grow into cumulus congestus, extending into the middle cloud region. And then by late afternoon, into early evening, you might have a cumulonimbus cloud. That is the thunderstorm cloud. While its dark base may be no more than a couple thousand feet above the surface, its top may extend to near the top of the troposphere, um, 35, 40,000 feet high. Eventually, it can get the top of the cumulonimbus can get high enough where the winds aloft help push it out and it can no longer rise in the stratosphere because remember in the stratosphere temperature increases with height that layer is stable it's um there's not strong upward motion so the top begins to spread out for that region too and it can form an anvil notice the fuzzy appearance fuzzier appearance of this top of the cloud compared to the more puffy uh, parents lower, that's because at the top you only are, have ice crystals. The cloud is becoming glaciated. There can be very strong updrafts and drown drafts, sometimes on the order of 40, 50, 60 miles per hour. Um, generally, the, the stronger the vertical motions in the cumulonimbus, the heavier the rainfall, the faster, the bigger the drops can grow, and faster they can fall. And, folks, the larger the hailstones. Okay? We'll talk about specific seeds for seat speeds for a certain hailstone size okay but extremely s strong updrafts and downdrafts can produce baseball sized hail okay so some of the thunderstorm hazards include hail right which can do a lot of damage heavy rain which when it sits over a region can flood right lightning strike which can start fires okay um thunder um which can scare people okay and cumulonimbus clouds produce rainfall that is more showery. Why? Because cumulonimbus clouds, even though they can be incredibly tall, as you see, notice they don't appear that wide um, relatively. And so cumulonimbus clouds aren't going to take up more than a small fraction of the sky. They're not very wide, and so they will pass much faster than nimbostratus. In addition, cumulonimbus clouds move faster than nimbostratus, so that's why you're going to get showery precipitation. It won't last that long, but it will be heavy. Okay. So, now that we've had an overview look of the, all the clouds on one picture, let's see if we can start to identify some clouds by individually. How about these clouds? Thin wispy clouds they're bright if you need to pause the video what types of clouds are these cirrus here are thin bright clouds that look like look like small individual puffs okay producing a mackerel sky okay and here's a tree these are Cirrocumulus. Oh, here it looks like a um, fairly thin cloud. And look, this is the sun. And look, there's a halo around the sun. And here's an old TV antenna, um, a roof antenna, and here's a tree. What types of clouds are these? Cirrostratus. Hmm, more old TV antennas, right? Kids these days have no idea how hard it was for people, in, even my generation, and I'm still pretty young, okay? Before, when I was really little, before we had cable, we had, you know, antenna TV, and man, the, the struggles we had to go through to f watch, you know, cartoons and sports, right? You had to, like, move around the rabbit ears, sometimes hold them, put foil on them, right? It was tough, okay? So... Here are some rounded puffs. They appear light to mildly gray. Okay, they definitely look look larger than zero than the high cloud puffs. Okay, these are alto cumulus, right? Anytime you have cumu in the name of the cloud, you're going to be dealing with some puffs. Okay. Hmm. This cloud looks like it's appearing the 
covering the entire sky. It's kind of blue, gray. And look, the sun is distorted, watery. This is Alto Stratus. Oh, a beach with a dock and some waves, okay? Nice picture. These puffy clouds look a lot larger to our eyes than Cerro Cumulus and Alto Cumulus. They definitely look closer. Notice the bottoms are dark gray, but the sides and tops are brighter in color. What do you think these clouds are? They are pairing in groups. These are stratocumulus. Oh, sheet-like cloud covering the entire sky, it looks like. Um, ignore the smaller, the darker gray clouds in front. Those might be some cumulus, but look at the overlying behind cloud. It does look kind of blue, but big hint. It, it, the sun is not visible through this cloud. And if you were in this picture, you were standing near the tree or the car, maybe you'd want to be inside the car because let me tell you, it's raining. Only two types of clouds can produce rain. Which one is this? Nimostratus, right? It's not cumulonimbus because it's covering the entire sky. Um, it's sheet-like, not puffy. And if you were standing here, the, the rain would be light to moderate, okay? You wouldn't uh, be wet within a matter of a few seconds, okay? Oh! Light, well, moderate to dark gray, perhaps. Um... Sheet-like cloud. Let me tell you, the sun would not be visible through it. It's not raining at all. This cloud makes it depressing in the morning. Well, if it keeps lasting over and over. Okay, not a whole lot of sunlight will get through the surface because it's reflected. And if you hike up the one of these hills on either side of this valley, the cloud will reach the ground. It will become fog. This is Stratus. Now, it's very interesting how sometimes stratus will cover the entire sky in the morning time, and then within an hour, it can completely burn off. Let's look at some pictures of our city, San Jose, right? We know the way to San Jose, hopefully, because we have to go to San Jose State University to take classes. Okay. This is a picture from just over a year ago. Um, just about a year ago. Okay. Wednesday, October 7th, 2015, right? Giants weren't in the playoffs this year. It was an odd year, okay? And here are some of the buildings of the San Jose skyline, right? Very impressive. The buildings get to 200, 250 feet, okay? Um, the Knight Rider building, although I think the name changed recently to, like, Tribune building. And that famous building that's just east of the Safeway, right? The Safeway downtown, the Market Safeway, okay? And look, you have kind of dark gray sheet-like stratus covering the entire sky. This is, picture was taken, as you can see, at 9.06 a.m., okay? Look what happened just an hour later. And by the way, this portion of the sky looks covered, but maybe already the stratus is starting to burn off because, look, it's the top of the night rider building, or rider building, however you pronounce it, looks brighter. It looks like some sunlight's trying to peek through. Let's go one hour, actually less, about 55 minutes into the future. Wow, look at that. Now what do you see? What's different? You see blue sky instead of dark gray stratus. The buildings look brighter, okay? You see more shadows, okay? You see more lots, park or cars in this parking lot because it's later and more people are at work, okay? As opposed to right at 9 a.m., okay? Now, we can also look from another perspective. Actually, yeah, um, I didn't say, but this picture was taken from the top of Duncan Hall, okay, where the meteorology department is, and it's looking northwest, okay? Now, we can also look another direction, because there's cameras at the top of Duncan Hall. There's we the weather station up there, and cameras operated by our Department of Meteorology and Climate Science here at San Jose State. And the cameras look different directions. There's one that looks east. Here's a picture just before 9 a.m. Oh, look at this. The CVB building, maybe you've been there. Joe West Hall. That new building that was under construction a year ago, but now isn't it like finished, basically? Okay. 
trees. And look, the parking lot, the 7th Street Garage, a crane, okay? Before 9 a.m., still pretty overcast conditions, stratus cloud, okay? Although the sun's trying to peek through. Look what happened 55 minutes later. Look. What a difference. Now you see blue sky, um, especially higher up. You do see some of that haze toward the horizon, right? Here's Mount Hamilton is over here. Um, these are the uh, hills and mountains of the Diablo Range east of San Jose, okay? But the stratus layer is pretty gone, okay? You do see a few cirrus clouds, high clouds, okay? So, and the uh, parking lot, right, looks a lot brighter, right? You can see the reflection of the cars now, reflection of the sunlight off the cars, whereas before it was darker. You also see a lot more cars, right, since it's later and now um, there's more students on campus as well as instructors. Now, here are those fair weather, puffy, cotton appearing clouds. These are cumulus, fair weather cumulus. Okay, and these, this is a nice um, landscape. We have some trees, some grass, some greener grass, some browner grass, okay. This could, this could be the, uh, it's not, but this could be the hills east of San Jose. Now, perhaps in the morning there was cumulus, and now this is the early afternoon, and now the cumulus clouds are rising into the middle levels. They're expanding more vertically, okay. Um, this is a water and a boat, another boat, okay. These are cumulus congestus. In fact, this picture was taken along Maryland's or Maryland's eastern shore. Here's another picture from uh, the camera atop Duncan Hall. This was also taken in October 2015, um, a few days later than the earlier photographs. And I like this photograph because you see the bright sun with the you can almost just see the rays, if you will. Okay, very beautiful. And then you see the clearer skies and the uh, East Bay Hills. You see the haze layer, okay? Those dust and smoke particles reflecting sunlight. Also, I remember part of the reason I showed this picture was because this picture was taken around the same time, 9 a.m., as those earlier pictures with Stratus, okay? But the difference was that the, the, the morning was a lot clearer, okay, and so, um, of course, you're familiar with that. Sometimes in the morning it's clear, sometimes in the morning it's cloudy, okay. Definitely can affect how you wake up. Maybe on a cloudy day you need more coffee, okay, or maybe you don't. Oh, this is such a beautiful picture. This is a figure from the book. So beautiful because you have so many nice elements, Right? You see this cloud. This is, what type of cloud is this, first of all? This is a cumulonimbus cloud, the thunderstorm cloud. And look, you see the base, okay, here, above this water, okay, could be an ocean. And you see this darker region extending below the base here? That's called a rain shaft. That's where the rain is falling, okay? Then, as you go higher, notice that the cloud begins blowing from right to left. Those are upper-level winds pushing the anvil top, okay? You see the sun behind the cumulus. So it's so beautiful how the edges are illuminated in bright colors, the sunlight trying to um, get through along the edges, okay? Um, notice that there's a white, bright area under beneath the anvil, the sunlight scattered by falling ice crystals. In fact, there's some snow falling and the uh, ice crystals are scattering, reflecting all directions sunlight. Okay, Very beautiful. Now let's talk about fog. Fog is a cloud on the ground. Okay, But fog isn't quite that simple because there's multiple types of fog. It can form in different ways. We'll talk about how so. This picture shows San Francisco covered in fog, right? Here's um, the Transamerica Pyramid, the Bank of America building, here's the Golden Gate Bridge, and there's that layer of fog over the city.
Here's the Transamerica Pyramid. Here's the Bank of America building. Here's the Golden Gate Bridge. And there's that layer of fog covering the city. Very common to have fog in the summertime over San Francisco. Why, though? You might be wondering, right? Why is it so often so clear in San Jose in the summertime, okay, and warm, whereas just to our north, San Francisco is often cloudy? Okay, why? We'll talk about why. Let's talk about the types of fog. There are five major types of fog, okay? Radiation fog, often found in the wintertime over the Central Valley of California, forms by radiational cooling, forms during the nighttime. Advection fog forms differently, whereas radiation fog requires little, in fact, it's helpful to have little air movement. Advection fog requires transfer of um, temperature properties. It requires movement of air. And this fog is the famous summertime San Francisco fog. Fog can form as air rises along a mountain. Okay. That's upslope fog. Fog can form when two different air masses, those with different temperature and humidity properties, mix. And before, perhaps the two air masses had relative humidities below 100%. For each of them and they were unsaturated you can mix them and owing to the fact that moisture um, potential saturation vapor pressure does not linearly increase with temperature it increases exponentially with temperature you can end up with an when you mix the air masses an air mass that is saturated and also fog can form as um, steam basically rising above water now the first three radiation advection and upslope fog occur when air cools to the dew point temperature. That is, the temperature drops to the dew point and saturation is reached, whereas the other two occur when air masses are mixed. Let's talk about radiation fog. It's also known as ground or tule fog, owing to tule vegetation. And it forms on clear, calm nights when a shallow layer of moist air is in contact touching the ground. As the ground cools, okay, such as during a long, clear winter night, right, with calm winds, good radiational cooling conditions, as you know, the moist air above it cools and condenses. Remember how the ground cools the air in contact with it. And a surface inversion forms, radiation temperature inversion forms. Well, as the air cools more and more, um, it can reach the dew point. Okay, and so you first get saturation along the surface, right, dew, and then that lower air can begin to cool the air above it through convection, um, as well as with some weak conduction. And you can get fog starting at the ground and then building up higher. Fog, radiation fog always starts at the ground and grows upward. It's common over land during fall and winter um, when the nights are long, okay, so good radiational cooling conditions. It's very common in valleys. Why? Because of what we're talking about, how in the valleys, the cold, dense air sinks down, and that helps um, helps this fog form because radiation fog forms when the air cools to the dew point temperature. And it can persist unless the winds pick up, mixing the air out, helping evaporate the fog, or colder air aloft moves in, which helps first the air, the fog build and then eventually completely mix out, okay? But um, if the winds do not pick up and the fog is deep enough, it can sometimes last for long periods of time. Radiation fog varies in depth. Anywhere from literally at just a few feet, sometimes you can see a radiation fog layer a few feet above the ground, that's it, to over a thousand feet high. It's, it's always stationary, okay, it doesn't move, it's found near the ground. This type of fog can reduce visibility greatly. Occasionally, visibility can be reduced to near zero, less than a quarter mile, sometimes down to an eighth of a mile. And so this makes driving very hazardous in the Central Valley during wintertime, okay. Um, here's a diagram illustrating how radiation fogs. The Earth's surface emits infrared radiation upward 
at night and um, on a clear night there's no clouds to trap, absorb, and re-emit that infrared radiation so the ground cools, eventually saturation reached, right, when the temperature drops to the dew point temperature. Any further cooling once saturation reached means that the air cannot hold as much water vapor so some of that water vapor has to condense out and that's the dew you see on the ground and then as the ground continues to cool the air in contact with it cools the air above it and the air above cools the air above it and so on and so eventually you get saturation building a layer of saturation building upward and you, so you get fog thickening upward as cooling continues okay further radiation of cooling at the top of the fog layer also helps deepen it along with cooling below okay temperature inversion usually exists um above the fog so basically once you go above the fog here temperature will increase okay now as we talked about radiation fog might only be a few feet high here are some pictures i took a couple years ago in late october of 2014 illustrating small scale radiation fog in newark california okay so the pictures were taken about 7.45 a.m. on October 26, 2014, near Cherry Street and Stephen Bull Stevenson Boulevard in Newark, if any of you are familiar with the area. Okay, there's a, near Cherry Street and Stevenson Boulevard in Newark, there's a, um, basically an area of open field where vegetation can be grown. There were clear skies, um, light winds, and a moist surface layer because the previous day rain had fallen and so that helped moisten the air near the surface and the clear skies and light winds helped allow temperatures to drop to the dew point and saturation to occur above the soil vegetation type i'd like to point out that the fog formed in a very shallow valley in fact it's you can kind of see it here but um this soil where crops can be grown is at a lower elevation it's in a small valley than the um either on either any side of it so i took this picture from near the street but this grass slopes downward okay so this helped form a um uh, thermal belt if you will a small scale thermal belt along the higher hill and the colder air sunk into this small valley okay the fog was i'd estimate no more than 10 feet high okay and a strong inversion was probably present at the top, okay? Really would have liked to go and um, explore it, um, but I but this was at the end of an overnight shift. I worked overnight at Amazon nearby and had to get, um, e I can't remember, either to school or back home, one or the other, because two days a week I'd teach classes in the morning after working overnight. And uh, so I couldn't venture that long, okay? Um, I do have some more pictures for you, okay? This is a zoom in with my camera, okay? Notice the fog, okay? That's radiation fog. Now, radiation fog, again, can form of the Central Valley. This satellite image taken shows, looks like a blanket of fog covering the valley, okay? Starting from maybe near Chico, extending to Sacramento, Stockton, Modesto, Fresno, right? down to Hanford, Bakersfield area, okay? Um, the uh, fog is also pushing its way toward the delta, okay? And so, once you go into the uh, foothills, right, in the mother load, you don't have fog anymore because the air was warmer, right? The thermal belt, and so you're not at saturation, okay? You also see all the snow in the Sierras, right? Um, and Lake Tahoe, okay? Keep Tahoe blue, okay? Let's talk about advection fog. Now, to help you understand how advection fog forms, think of a glass of ice water on a warm, humid day. Okay, it's warm, it's moist, sticky, so you have your glass of ice water. Okay, it's good to stay hydrated on warm, humid days. What happens is, as the warm, moist air makes contact with the colder glass, condensation can form. The same principle occurs when warm, moist air moves over cooler waters, okay? It's very common for this advection fog to form over eastern Pacific Ocean waters due to the California current and upwelling, okay? So what happens is warmer, moister air from the central Pacific 
moves eastward over the eastern Pacific off the California coast. And the water off California is cold. One, there's a California current, a cold ocean current coming from the Gulf of Alaska off our state. That's why we don't get hurricanes. There's also upwelling that brings colder water from lower, deeper to the surface. So the warm, moist air, right, from the Central Pacific, it's moving over colder water. What happens? The colder water chills that warm, moist air to the dew point, and that forms fog. Okay, and this and fog requires movement because it what needs to happen is the warm, moist air that generated from warmer over warmer waters has to move eastward over the colder water. Okay, eventually this fog can evaporate as it moves inland, as it moves over hotter surfaces, which evaporate it. Okay. Um, but this advection fog is associated with the quote-unquote marine layer, okay? And it can range anywhere from 500 feet to up to a few thousand feet. Generally, the greater the depth of the marine layer in the Bay Area, um, the farther it can move inland, okay? Occasionally, the marine layer can get deep enough where it starts to extend um, toward the Central Valley, okay? But if the marine layer is only, oh, 1,000 to 1,500 feet deep, it's not going to make it over the Oakland Hills, okay? But if it becomes deeper, it can, and then it can start to move into, say, the uh, Walnut Creek Concord area or the Livermore Pleasanton area, okay? It also can push in from the southern bay and move into north San Jose and then extending into south San Jose, okay? Um, there's a gap between Monterey and... Um, San Jose, okay, along 101, there's a gap near uh, Morgan Hill, Gilroy, where the uh, fog can push in um, from the coast, okay, gap in the hills. Um, so, unlike radiation fog, where the condensation is cur occurs because surface temperature is decreasing, Air is moving horizontally. Warm, moist air is over a colder surface. So you can distinguish advection fog from radiation fog because unlike radiation fog, advection fog moves horizontally. Sea fogs are always advection fogs because the ocean doesn't radiate heat in the same way as land and never cools sufficiently to produce radiation fog. Okay, cools much slower. Fog forms at sea, and when warm air associated with a warm current drifts over a cold current, condensation can take place. Sometimes the fogs get pulled in by lower pressure, um, as can be the case off the Pacific coast of North America. Occasionally, advection fog can form when merit, actually warmer maritime or ocean air drifts over a cold inland area. Okay, Instead of over cold water, it might drift over cold land, um, this ha can happen at nighttime, occasionally over the Gulf Coast. Very warm, moist air moves over not necessarily a cold but cooler land, and then that forms fog. Okay, but the advection fog over New Orleans, for example, it's different from advection fog over San Francisco, and it's more of a warm fog. Okay, so the diagram illustrating advection fog: you have warm, moist air, a rich, um moves over a colder surface, whether it be a colder ocean or colder land, and that chills the temperature of the air to the dew point. Any further cooling produces saturation, forming fog. Also, the stronger the onshore winds in the Bay Area, the more um, the fog can move inland. Okay, So once the onshore winds get really strong, th that's usually a signal, one, of a deeper marine layer, and two, that the marine layer can uh, extend further inland. What's interesting is that on rare occasions, advection fog can actually meet radiation fog, okay? Now, the thing is, they don't necessarily occur at the same time because advection fog often forms in the summertime in the Bay Area, whereas radiation fog forms more in the late fall to the winter time, okay? But occasionally, maybe in the fall or in the spring, you might have both. And so it's, it's happened where, say, in the Caldecott Tunnel, which is divides um, 
Alameda County from Contra Costa County. It's where Highway 24 goes under the Oakland Hills from Rockridge area into Orinda. Occasionally, you can have advection fog being pushed through the tunnel and radiation fog that came in from the valley move westward at the other end, meaning that eastward moving radiation advection fog. Very fascinating, I think. They often associate fog in Sacramento with winter, cold, clear, cold nights, radiation fog. But again, very occasionally, rarely, maybe a few days a year, the advection fog from the Bay Area will push all the way into the uh, Central Valley. Okay. Components of California, coastal advection fog, Pacific high pressure builds in, which just blocks the storms. Okay. Warm, moist air, and you have clockwise an outward movement around it, and you have a cold ocean current, and um, the movement around this high, the northward winds, okay, and northeastward winds can help pull water away from the coast, which forces um, surface water away from the coast, forcing colder, lower, deeper water to replace it, which helps enable also cold water temperatures at the surface along with the current and it can be very warm in sacramento in the summertime this actually produces low pressure we'll talk about how and so you get high pressure off the coast with that pacific high lower pressure over the inland valley that produces a pressure gradient which causes winds which can help upwelling it can also help onshore winds which can push the fog eastward okay just a figure showing average sea surface temperatures along the west coast of North America during the month of August. Notice the very cold ocean temperatures off the northern California coast associated with the cold California current as well as upwelling. And that cold surface of the ocean is what helps enable advection fog to form when warmer, moister air from westward moves over it. Okay, here's the Golden Gate Bridge. I almost said Bay Bridge. Upslope fog forms when moist air slowly rises over elevated terrain. And as air rises, remember it cools. Remember as air rises, the pressure on it decreases. It expands. It takes work to expand. It cools and it can condense. Typically, upslope fog occurs during winter and spring months on the eastern side of the Rockies. Boulder, Colorado is home to Colorado University, right, the Buffaloes. It's also home to NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, which is a beautiful um, campus overlooking Boulder, but um, also it's incredible in terms of this, the knowledge there. There's all these smart meteorology and uh, atmospheric science um, people and lot great great for if you're a meteorologist to go there and um, the fog can sometimes form as the air moves westward up the uh, say the front range of the Rocky Mountains okay get moist air rising which can form fog okay remember fog is a cloud on the ground so moist air flows toward the slope as air rises with the terrain it cools to the temperature of condensation any further lifting produces further cooling which means water vapor has to condense out now and that forms fog along the slope this upslope lifting can also form clouds along the slope okay remember fog is a cloud on the ground in contact with the ground evaporation fog is caused by mixing of two unsaturated air masses with different temperatures okay and what's interesting is that these two air masses that are unsaturated and therefore have relative humidity of less than 100% can mix and what can form is an, an uh, air mass that is saturated. Okay. Think of seeing your breath on a cold morning. Your breath was not saturated until it was cooled by the air. If it's a cold morning, right, what happens when you blow out? Well, the air from your mouth, which is very warm, right? Remember your body temperature is what? 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit on average. Very warm and it's moist, okay? Water, right? 
coming from your breath, um, coming from, you know, your mouth with your moisture and so forth. And of course, our bodies are made up of a lot of water. Well, that moist air gets cooled by the uh, air, and it actually mixes. And the breath was not necessarily saturated. It wasn't until it was cooled by the air. So what, what happens is when you breathe, right, you're breathing out on that cool morning, the breath, you can't see it initially, okay? It's not at saturation. You can't see it. And the air is not at saturation. It's a cold, dry morning, necessarily. It's think of a cold, clear morning. But then what happens when the war warmer and moister breath mixes with the colder, dry air, then you get saturation. You can actually see it, your cloud forming from your breath. Okay. Of course, you can see this when football players um, are participating during games in very cold weather. Steam fog is caused when cold air is present over a warm body of water. Examples include fog forming over a lake on a cold morning. This can happen over the um, Great Lakes region. Or steam that rises from a thermal pool or a hot tub okay, at nighttime okay, when you're uh, having a party turned up. As long as the water is warmer than the unsaturated air above, water will evaporate from the water into the air. Now, as water evaporates from the warm body of water into the air, that raises the dew point of the air, increases the dew point. And if there's enough mixing happening, the air becomes saturated. Okay? The colder air directly above the water is heated from below and becomes warmer than the air directly above it. Then this warmer air... Uh, rises, okay, and so from a distance, the rising condensing vapor appears as steam, okay. And so here is Chicago, right? Here is the former Sears Tower, okay. Um, still the tallest building in North America. It used to be the tallest building in the world, okay. And it's a cold morning. It's a very cold morning. See this gentleman with the hat and the coat, and he looks bundled up. And it looks like, almost like there was fire rising, right, from the uh, lake. This is Lake Michigan, okay? Fire, Beavis would like that, rising from the lake. But what's really happening is it's incredibly cold in Chicago in the wintertime. It's really cold and dry, okay, in the air. But that lake, being the fact that lake takes more energy to cool down, it's actually relatively warm. And so it's warmer, and so there's a lot of evaporation off it. And um, it's raising the dew point of the... Uh, air above it and it's forming this quote unquote steam. Okay. And I'll show this picture of Chicago, of course, but um hopefully the Giants can take it one game at a time now that they're down two oh against the Cubs and uh excited, okay? Because they have played their best baseball under elimination games, right? Won nine straight playoff elimination games. Finally a point that fog does not really burn off um you've you've heard heard this term in the news and i know i said it earlier in the lecture um it's not really literally burning like on fire off but what's happening is the ground becomes warm enough or it's becoming warm enough to evaporate the water and so the air is no longer saturated okay that's it for lecture five